afternoon session. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Averett from uh, UC San Diego, and uh, he'll be talking about the dynamics of correlated electron materials at low and high fluids. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I certainly appreciate the invitation to attend this workshop, and I certainly enjoyed uh, the talks today. In some ways or another, we're working in different areas, and I'll try to get that across today in terms of uh, this idea of doing things from low to high fluids. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to first tell you a few words uh, on these regimes of ultra-fast uh, optic studies and correlated electron materials. When I say regimes, I mean this low to high fluids. So I'll try to get a little bit of feel for that, because there's different types of experiments that we're capable of doing. Um, then I'm going to give you a couple of examples from our work, um, time permitting. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a high fluid study that we recently did on strain lanthanum calcium manganese oxide, uh, an electron, but this is really interesting in that we saw a photo induced um, anti ferromagnetic insulator to a ferromagnetic metal phase that's metastable. Okay. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some low fluence work that we've done on uh, samarium hexafluoride thin films. Um, I'm not going to try to read too much into this except to say that even on these thin films, we do see something that's consistent with having a hybridization gap. Okay, so these films do have something to them. Okay. Um, a lot of people are involved in the work that I'll talk about today. Uh, the majority of the work that I'll be talking about today is, is, is uh, work of G.D. Jenks. He, he, he did his PhD with me at BU and was nice enough to come to UCSD as a postdoc. He's working with me and Dmitry Bassoff. Um, and then there's also Peter. I'm not going to tell you uh, about his work because he's going to tell you about his work later on where he's done time result studies on uranium with the new silicon tube. Um, in addition, uh, we've been doing some of the work I'll show you today was with Dimitri, uh, Keith Nelson, who just, who just got here, um, and then Wendy and Lou and Richard Green provided us the samples that we're looking at. Okay, so the research themes uh, in my group. We like to do dynamic spectroscopy of all different types of materials. Um, you know, we're interested in doing metamaterials and plasmonics as well. Um, and we're interested certainly in quant correlated electron materials. Probably the, the, the most interesting part of us is photo-induced control. Can we use lasers to uh, acquire, to create new phases transiently or otherwise in materials? But we're also interested in this various non-equilibrium phenomena. So there's many ways you can look at this, but for the purposes of this talk, I, I just want to break it down into these, really these two, what, what I consider to be these two regimes. One is this high fluence, okay? The idea here is, you know, you have some um, complex energy landscape due to interacting degrees of freedom, and you, at these high fluences, perhaps you can access metastable states or other states that you wouldn't otherwise expect. And what I mean by otherwise expect is they're not thermally accessible. So that's kind of this high fluence regime. And then, of course, there's the low fluence regime. We saw some examples in the nice uh, talks uh, earlier in this session on, on, on photo emission. But the idea here is you want to look at dynamics within a given phase. And so the pump that you use to drive these dynamics should not erase the phase that you wish to probe. Okay? And that's the very definition of low fluence. You want to stay within that phase. Um, but to, well, one of the things that's really happened, one of the most exciting things I think about time results spectroscopy in the past 10 years, is the ability to probe over really the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Right? This, these are all, you know, this is just wonderful compared to say 15, 20 years ago, where we can now uh, excite a sample and then probe anywhere from the terahertz through the UV access all these relevant excitations that we're interested in. And of course, also, as we saw today, some really nice examples of photo emission, which also time resolved electron diffraction. And of course, there's a lot of nice work uh, on time resolved soft and hard x-ray um, facilities. Okay. Um, that's, that's the point, is, is access to these spectral excitations um, with these probes allows us something that we really need for correlated electron materials. Um, that's also true for the pump, okay? So in principle, you could, anything that you can probe with, you can pump with. Um, but the majority of experiments used to be indivisible, but now more recently, there's also a lot of interesting work in being able to do mid-infrared pump and also terrorist pump. I suspect someday people will also try to pump with these things. Uh, I've seen some inadvertent pumping with 
hard x-rays, for example. Um, but that, that wasn't purposeful. These are maybe purposeful. Okay. Um, and so there's really these different regimes that, that, that are of interest. And so uh, I'll just very briefly go over this in terms of these different pumps. Uh, in the far infrared, we usually, what you see in terms of the pumps is we see people quoting things in terms of not fluences, but in terms of fields, where a low field would be something on the order of kilovolt per centimeter, and high fields would be on the order of you know, megavolt per centimeter and higher. And I think I think we'll hear a lot more about that tomorrow in Keith's talk, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. And then there's this inter it, oh I should mention the reason the reason we usually quote things in fields here is a large fraction of what's going on here is basically field driven processes or tunnel type processes that are really field driven, not photon driven at least in that sort of picture. Um, and then in the mid infrared, I don't know of any low fluence pump experiment. As far as I can tell, they're all high fluence pump experiments where you're either at high fields in a non-resident condition, or when you're trying to do this drive the lattice with these nonlinear phononics, which some of you may have heard of, you're kind of in this millijoule per square centimeter range, which is considered high fluence. Okay. And then in the visible range, uh, we really are covering now where we're doing photo excision across bands. The fluence range we're talking about on the low end. Is about 0.1 microjoule per square centimeter up to 10 millijoules per square centimeter or even higher on the high fluence stage. Okay? Um, and today, I'm not going to talk about either the terahertz or the infrared pumps because the two examples I'm going to show you is really visible. So I'm going to give you a little bit more feel for what 0.1 microjoule per square centimeter or 10 millijoules per square centimeter means when we're doing um, optical pump. Okay? Uh, this is just a brief aside. Uh, my guess of excitation parameters of greatest relevance to as many of these electron systems that, for example, talked about this morning. On the optical side, I, I, this isn't really a guess. I know this because we do these experiments, but you want to be in the very low fluence regime. Um, and then as we move towards doing terahertz fields to drive these systems, you're gonna, I would guess you also want to be in the kilovolt per centimeter range. And again, that brings brings us back to this idea of, that we saw presented earlier in terms of the Higgs mode in niobium nitride, where you see these coherent order parameter oscillations. This was done at very low field system in kilovolt per centimeter. And so maybe, maybe, maybe this sort of idea will be of relevance in some of these other materials at low temperatures. So I think that would be a fun thing to talk about, to see if we can come up with any cool experiments you know, with either of these low regimes in terms of um, some of these Okay, so now moving um, on to this low fluence regime. The low fluence regime, again, is this 0.1 to 10 microjoules per square centimeter. The reason why you want this low fluence is quite simply because uh, first order, the induced temperature change is given by the energy density deposited by, by the specific heat. And so you want to make sure that that temperature change is such that you remain in the phase that you want to do the dynamic studies on. And the state of the art in terms of doing these measurements is still with optical pump, optical probe, okay, all visible. Uh, and, and when you really push things, you can measure induced changes in the reflectivity of 10 to the minus 7. The argument against visible excitation is that you create a lot of high energy excitations that then have to filter down before you get to the interesting electrodynamics in the materials. Uh, I would say that, yes, that's true. But uh, as I'll show you, you can still learn about these materials in, in spite of this sort of excitation. And plus, with visible excitation, when you really want to do these high sensitivity, sensitivity measurements, uh, you have fast in terms of time resolution. I also mean relatively fast in terms of the amount of time a graduate student has to spend in the lab. It's rel relatively speaking, it's more easy to, to do. Um, you can work on very small samples. They don't have to be much smaller than 100 microns. Probably even smaller. And it still has the highest sensitivity. Okay? And in fact, um, when I was at Los Alamos, this was when, when Yuri Dempsey and I and others were working with Tony Taylor at Los Alamos, we actually did already uh, 13 years ago one of these high sensitivity experiments on heavy fermion compound, deuterium, silver, copper, four. Um, and so here's what you expect when you do a pump probe measurement. If you were looking at gold or let's say the non magnetic analog titium, silver, copper, four, you do the measurements and you essentially see at any temperature a very fast a second relaxation. This is just as the electrons basically give up their energy to the lattice of electron flow uh, equilibration. Uh, but on the terbium silver copper 4, you see something quite anomalous. 
name you see that this lifetime, actually the rise time, but more importantly, that lifetime increases by more than two orders of magnitude. So this is because of the opening of the hybridization gap. I'm not going to go into the details of that right now, but I would just say that this high sensitivity ultrafast optics, uh, that's a pretty marked signature compared to if it just was to stay flat at about a picosecond. So that's some evidence that you can really look at uh, low energy electrodynamics even with all optical probes on final ultrafast times. Okay. Um, now the high fluence regime, this one's pretty interesting in the sense that uh, this is where you can kind of get into the dynamics of the control. Okay. And, and this is a little cartoon picture of that where you have this adiabatic potential energy. And the idea would be that you do some relatively intense excitation, something like one millimeter per square centimeter. You're starting to get to something on the order of uh, maybe one photon per every 10 million cells or something like that. But it's starting to be a pretty high density. Okay. Um, but the idea is that you can then cause this evolution to a new lattice structure and electronic order and really have a photo-induced phase transition that maybe isn't thermally accessible. Okay. And there's interesting things here when you drive a phase transition. What are the time scales? Are there multiple pathways in terms of those different uh, you know, photon sources that we have to excite things? Can we disentangle the interacting degrees of freedom and, and etc. Okay. Um, I'll just give you a couple of examples of this. Here's a really nice example on 1 tenth, uh, 1 T tenth of disulfide. Uh, the reason I'm showing you this because uh, it's a really nice example where they came with about a 1 millijoule pulse at low temperatures and they have a change in um, conductivity and the resistance decreases by more than three orders of magnitude. And this is metastable. Okay? This stays, this persists until you increase the temperature back to bring it back to the insulating phase. And the reason I bring this one up because as far as I know, there's two examples where, two materials where this happens. One is this 1T tantalum disulfide, and the other one is the one that I'm going to show you in a few minutes on this lanthanum calcium, the strain lanthanum calcium magnets on the side. So this is a really neat example of the sorts of things that people are trying to do. There's also uh, many, many experiments of this flavor on cuprates, vanadates, manganites, and nickelates, looking at trying to melt, for example, charge order and, and, and obtain a superconducting state, or just looking at the dynamics of Okay, um, I guess that's the only example I'm going to give you on that. So one of the things that underlies both the low fluence and the high fluence uh, measurements is the idea of spectral wave transfer. As we know from, from time integrated optics, one of the things that's uh, really interesting in terms of, uh, you know, it's a nice signature of if you have strong correlations, is that you get, you get spectral wave transfer from low energies up to high energies of several EV. Okay? And there's even ways to quantify and characterize that okay? and get some sort of empirical idea if a material is strongly correlated or not based on the spectral wave transfer um, and, and turning that into a kinetic energy comparing that to the band energy. Um, but I just want to show you a couple of examples of this in terms of uh, real data to get some idea of what's going on. Let's just look at the length of calcium manganese oxide. Maybe people, you've probably seen this before, but when you're at room temperature, you're in a paramagnetic insulating phase, and then as you cool down, you go into a ferromagnetic metallic state. So there's this massive transfer of spectral weight as you develop this coherent transport. Um, and, and, and so that's what you see time integrated, but a lot of these dynamic measurements can be thought of as dynamic spectral weight transfer. When you photo excite, you see spectral weight transfer from high low energies to low energies, vice versa, or from you know the, the delta function at zero frequency of superconductor up to higher energies and things like that. So I think what really underlies a lot of these experiments is this idea of dynamic spectral weight transfer. Okay, so the experiments I'm going to show you today um, are 800 nanometer pump for both experiments, so 1.5 EV photons. And we're just going to do, this is, this is an experiment we've been doing for a long time and it still hasn't petered out yet in terms of interest. But we're going to photo excite and then we're going to probe in the far infrared, in the far infrared. Okay. And so that, the way you can think about this is we have a way to measure conductivity with picosecond resolution. The first example I'm going to show you is the high flows work. This is work where we basically uh, are going to be above this kind of nominal millijoule per square centimeter range. This is where we've done this photo induced metastability in this lanthanum calcium, this strain lanthanum calcium magnets oxide. This just came out, uh, was published on, online um, 
about a little bit less than a month ago. Uh, this is work that we've done with Dmitry Vasov and Keith Nelson, who's here. Um, I'm going to tell you about certain aspects of this. Um, and with Keith, we've also done some really nice single shot measurements. I'm not going to talk about that because I think he might talk about that tomorrow. So I'm going to leave out some of, some of what we're doing here. But I'm going to give you some flavor of what's going on. So this is just a reminder of the manganites, which have been studied on and off uh, more or less intensely for quite some time now. This is, this is the canonical lanthanum calcium manganese oxide, where here we're looking at the tolerance factor as a function of temperature. And you can see that here, at, for the 0 0.7, 0 0.3, you go from low temperature ferromagnetic metal to ferromagnetic. It gets later, you look at resistivity as a function of temperature, and you have this nice colossal magnetic resistance over the five field. Resistivity. That's the standard manganite behavior. Uh, and, and this is an associated spectral wave transfer that I just showed you that occurs uh, as you cool down. Basically, talent. We actually looked at this a long time ago, uh, back in 2001. I think this is actually my first publication on correlated electron materials. And, and this was an example where we we didn't excite too intensely, so we, this was actually an example of doing dynamics within a phase. You can see we're always below TC. And, and what was interesting about this is that we could look at things away from equilibrium, right? We could look at spin lattice relaxation and electron bonon relaxation. But this was on this, this canonical magnetite that has a transition from um, paramagnetic metal to paramagnetic insulin. And there's been a lot of really nice studies on the magnetites in terms of the dynamics. I'd say it's one of the model systems driving dynamics control of the electron material system. Um, I think I'm going to skip this, except to say, well, th th there's the tolerance factor, so as you change the MNO, MN bond angle, uh, you expect to become more insulating. So if you, for example, took the lanthanum calcium and you put a crazy dimium calcium, that MNO, MN bond angle goes down, so the tolerance factor goes down, you actually get to a regime where at any temperature, this thing never has a metallic state. So you could, and there have been studies on a crazy dimium calcium in terms of time solve dynamics. But we're going to do something different. So our collaborators can grow these lanthanum calcium manganese films on neodymium gallate. In particular, we're looking at these ones that are grown on this particular uh, orientation of the neodymium gallate. So we get biaxial strain. Uh, the details aren't too important. Uh, what, what is more important is that if you look at the resistivity as a function of temperature at different um, fields, but in particular at zero tesla. Now, at zero tesla, this thing is always insulated. Okay? So we've, in some sense, hidden or quenched that uh, metallic state, although with an applied magnetic field, you can bring it back into the <coughs> This is the optical conductivity. Remember, when it's unstraining, that you, as you decrease temperature, you get the spectral wave transfer to go to a true coherent group. Here, the peak actually sharpens up. It becomes more like a polar on a peak, where you know, the, the likely origin of this almost certainly is an intercyte D to D transition on the EG manifold. But clearly, it's no longer as an insulator to metal transition in zero field. So what we decided to do was to do optical pump, terahertz probe, and see if we could see something interesting and try to look at this, albeit somewhat engineered, uh, complex energy landscape. And so that's what we did, and this is, I think, the most interesting part of these results. This is a terahertz conductivity as a function of temperature. Uh, now, if I were not to do any photo excitation and measure the terahertz conductivity, it would be flat with all the temperatures. So what we did now is we did optical pump, terahertz probe, here, 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 nothing happens. But then what happens is we see a change, and then we take away the excitation, it stays. But if we put more excitation on it at the same flow, it's two millimoles per square centimeter, it, um, it doesn't change anymore. But then if we decrease the temperature in photo excite, it then increases a little bit more. So there's this stepwise progression to where at 80K, now we, below 80K, we don't see any further changes. Um, get to this value of 1,200 inverse ohm centimeters, it's really quite surprising. We basically are accessing this metallic state without the application of a magnetic field. And we are, are fairly certain that we're saturated here, because if we take this data and plot it onto our DC resistivity curves, we see that it collapses. Okay, so you have this interesting scenario where um, you have this metastable photo-induced phase transition. And I, I should emphasize that point. 
if I take away my terahertz, if I take away my optical beam and I come back tomorrow and I'm at that temperature, it stays. It's not one of these phase transitions that lasts for 100 picoseconds. It's a truly metastable phase. The way you can redo, it, the way you can reset things is now without any further op optical excitation, you just increase the temperature, go back to insulating state and repeat this. We have some films, this is very robust, we have some films where we've been able to repeat this for, over the past couple of years. Okay. Um, now what is, what is interesting about this is it's not just an absorbed number of, integrated number of absorbed photons. And the way we look at that is we did measure the terahertz conductivity as a function of the number of laser shots of different influences. And it, it was just some sort of defect state or something where just depend on the critical number of the total number of absorbed photons. Eventually, these curves will all go to the same value of conductivity, but they saturate with different values. And so that shows you unequivocally that this is a cooperative effect. And, and, and so you really, you really need to have a certain number of excitations per unit volume to get um, a, a nice switch in the I'm not going to go too much into uh, the details of this process, but we, you know. The, the phenomenology of it that we, we think is going on, uh, in the simplest case, is probably has strong magneto-elastic coupling. You know, some term between the lattice and the magnetization allows you to get uh, you know, free energy that looks something like this, where photo excitation will bring you from you know, insulating antiferromagnetic state to the metallic, um, the, 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 the ferromagnetic metallic state. Uh, the process would be something along the lines of our photo excitation delocalizes a fraction of the EG electrons. This, because of the relaxation of the ion teller distortion, will initiate lattice motion, which will modify the exchange interactions and then, under the appropriate conditions, stabilize the new phase. So that's, that's, that's the phenomenology. We actually, Andy Millis is actually working on trying to do calculations of this initial process to see if we can get more understanding of that. And that's being done with James Rodinelli in terms of getting some. Some, some DFT calculations that feed into these. Very briefly, we're doing a lot of other measurements on this system now. I'll just show you a couple. This is work with Dmitry Basov. This is just a nice example where we're doing scanning probe microscopy. And I like this picture because there's a crack here and a crack here that's hard to see on the AFM topography. And that's where strain is going to be relieved. And where you relieve the strain, it's metallic, and where you don't have the strain, it's insulated. So that shows you know, that it's not some sort of weird defect or, or oxygen stoichiometry in these films. And then, of course, when you look at MFM, you see that the insulated region is insulating, and in the metallic region, it's ferromagnetic, just like you expect. So this is a nice, this is a nice, um, nice, just nice further characterization of these films. We've also done some single shot measurements where we come in with our pump and photo site measure is metallic and the domain is fully ferromagnetic. So we have these really nice single shot measurements. Okay, um, so that's an example of this high fluence regime. So now what I'm going to do is to show you, I'm going to go to the low fluence regime and talk about some results uh, where we've looked at, uh, these are films from Richard Green's group at the University of Maryland. We're looking at 100 nanometer films, preferentially 100 oriented. And, and, and we're going to, um, you know, obviously everyone's very interested in the economy state or the non trivial topological state. But the way I'm going to present this, since it is a film, is we'll be perfectly happy if we see, do we see anything in this film that gives evidence of a kind of insulated gap and or surface state? And, and we're going to do this both with air spectroscopy and with low energy, I mean, low fluence excitation, so that when we're at these low temperatures, we're still within that phase. So you can see, we're talking orders of magnitude different than the This is some uh, old work from Martin Dressel's group uh, from 1999, just to give you an idea of what the hybridization gap looks like in the far infrared. Um, you can see here, this, this is one terahertz, so we're, we're sort of looking below this range. And you can see in their data, they see an opening of the gap. You still have uh, you know, some finite conductivity. And then, then at the lowest temperatures, it looks like 3K. It looks like you see some sort of kind of time of it. It be some sort of impurity band. And so, you know, that's on a single crystal. We're going to look at things on thin films. This is just uh, terahertz time domain spectroscopy. 
uh, without any photo excitation. So now we're just measuring the Drew response over the frequency range that we can. What you see is the real part. And one of the nice things about terahertz time domain spectroscopy is you measure the electric fields and you get the amplitude and phase information, which means that over your spectral bandwidth, you get the real and imaginary part of the conductivity. You see the real part of the conductivity decreases with temperature and then saturates to some value that may be consistent with something like a, a surface state or surface state defects. And then if you look at the imaginary part of the conductivity, you see the slope rising out. When you expand on this, you actually see that this slope is in some sense give, gives a scattering rate. And you can see that as you decrease temperatures, it kind of bunches up um, from 50 to 25k at one slope. But then there's a dramatic change and there's an increase in, in, in the slope, which means you know, basically the scattering rate decreases quite a bit. So you might look at this and say, okay, well, there's something, there's some, there could be something here in terms of uh, condo, condo-like physics. I think we'll see a lot more details on single crystals tomorrow from, um, from the John Hopkins group, the Gilmore group. They'll we'll probably do this in a lot more detail. But, you know, there's something here, right? And you might not say there's much here, so then let's see if we can get a little bit more out of this and now go do that time resolve measurement. So now we're going to do the time resolve measurements where we do gentle excitation in a microjoule per square centimeter range, and we're going to measure the induced change in the electric field or the induced change in the real part of the conductivity as a function of temperature. And then we normalize that data and we fit it. Okay. Um, and so what we can do is we can get the lifetimes and the amplitudes from the exponential density. So this is the decay time as a function of temperature. And it increases by quite a bit. It goes from 3 picoseconds to 10 picoseconds. Um, that's not as dramatic as in the terbium silver copper 4, but there's a clear chain increase in the lifetime. That is consistent with the opening of a gap in the sense that you know, as a lifetime, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the Rockwell Taylor equation, but this corresponds to the opening of a gap and you get a phonon bottleneck. Uh, Peter Kissen will talk about this in a lot more detail when he talks about the uranium infinity 2 slipping tube. But this is consistent with the opening of a gap. But even more importantly, if you look at the amplitude, this is the amplitude of the data, um, you see that the amplitude increases. Okay? But in the Rothworth Taylor modeling, uh, or the Rothworth Taylor model, I should say, you actually expect, and this is a fit to that, you actually expect this amplitude to uh, go constant. Okay? And that's just because it's the number of thermal quasi particles goes to zero, which should flatten out. But instead, we see a deviation. 20k where this amplitude starts to decrease again. So the point here is that at 20k in time integrated spectroscopy and at 20k in the time result spectroscopy, we're seeing deviations from what you, you, you might expect uh, from, from a simple phenomenology of a single band dynamics in a single band model. Okay. And this just shows us a little bit more, a little bit more detail there. Um, you know, we basically have a clear deviation in the amplitude of 20k, the onset's the same temperatures as, as the terror section of TES. And, and when you do this fit moreover, this fits fairly well constrained. Um, this fits fairly well constrained, but when you do the fit over this range, you actually get a gap of 17 MPV, which is consistent with hybridization. So at least there's some evidence that whatever you think of these films, they certainly have some high, they basically have some condo like Okay, so with that, I'd like to summarize. Uh, you know, I, I, I think you know the point here was that we can do time resolve spec spectroscopy either gently or with bigger. The example I gave you with bigger was this uh, photo induced phase transition in the strain at calcium oxide. And uh, just very briefly, the gentle version uh, gently was these dynamics on the CMX floor. So, thank you. Uh, the talk is now open for questions. Andrew? Uh, so the, for the length uh, I remember seeing a very long time scale uh, evolution of the data from Tree and Joe. Uh, at least a couple of years ago. How does this relate to that? That, that wasn't exactly stable. It was on every time scale. It's changing to some extent. Not the scale is yeah, actually, that, that, um, I, I, I'm not quite aware that was that. That was on what sort of time scale was that? You mean after they reached some photo metastable state and then? I mean, they couldn't perform measurements on a time scale longer than seconds because uh, this slide is blowing up. But uh, 
Uh, but it seemed like it, it may have taken more than three days for it to happen. Right. We we never observed this for we observed this for like a day, but not days. But I suspect what would happen is if we stayed at the same Kelvin, I suspect we wouldn't see any change. But it would actually be an interesting study, probably in the context of to the extent that it's possible to do something like MFM or something and make a make a spot and then measure it over a function of maybe days. But I, I suspect what would happen is as as we increase the temperature. Then we get fluctuations to kick out of that. Thing. It's just a question of uh, whether in that metastable limit of 80K, how long does it last? I mean, it should, it should go back to the ground state at some time, but it could be different times, but we don't know. So, I'm first of all, this is to do. Uh, what is the relationship between the temperature and the temperature? But I was wondering why you promote it uh, with why. You know, you promote of course the metallic state of energy in the system. Right. And you have to do this at all temperature and somehow you think you have to do something. Right. right. And it's slow, it's frozen, right? And it says so, right? right? But then I was wondering, yeah, how how can I then imagine what's actually happening? Because why why would it does it create a special order of the well, I, th I think what happens, you know, I glossed, I went over that pretty fast, and, you know, I could give you a guess, um, and I, I, you know, I'm very hopeful that, you know, I, I'll just give you my guess, and then I'm hopeful that Andy Mellis will have the theory to say whether I'm right or wrong in, in the future. But the idea is that initial excitation that we do at 1.55 dB, it's an intersite D to D transition, okay, and these are Jan Teller distorted ions. So that very process of photo excitation is, is already going to cause a lattice motion. So you do that lattice motion, and then you, you know, that's going to then modify the exchange interactions. You obviously have to switch from anti ferromagnetic to So that initial process, that very process of photo excitation, it's got to initiate this process of lattice motion, and then which is going to modify the exchange interactions. But then the question is, okay, well, why does it stay? Right? And it looks like if you look at the, the photon density right here. You have to get a photon density so that locally there's four or five of, of, of these uh, distorted octahedra that are relaxed, and it's almost like it's almost like a nucleation model. You put enough energy locally where you have some sort of uh, yeah, so like like you get a, a little nucleation site where it becomes energy energetically favorable for it to then to stay in that delocalized ferromagnetic yeah. power. This kind of process can be quite a bit in that it's a low state, high state type of transition materials, right? interesting about this is that it's similar, like you said, to the slow spin high spin physics, but here you're coupling down the degrees of freedom that turns it into an yeah. interestingly macroscopic sort of phenomenon. One other thing that I should mention that I, I, I didn't, I really went over this way too fast, these plots, these, these are the data points, these curves here are actually plots to effective medium theory, so I should make it clear that on a shot-by-shot -shot basis what's happening is we're creating some fraction that's got a, some metallic volume fraction and the rest stays insulated. And then on the next shot, the fraction that was metallic stays metallic. Um, and, 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 then, and then, you know, a further so fraction. Yeah, you just increase the metallic volume. And these are fits from this very simple model. All right, well, Natalia and then Keith. Okay, actually, I would ask another question. But first, so if you, you say that it's an equation, how do you stay at the same temperature and just move it past this? Yeah, that's the thing that's interesting. No. Like if I like going back here, if I stay at this if I stay at this fluence, yeah. it saturates. Uh -huh. So that is peculiar, right? And you have to go to another temperature and then more sites become active. Okay. So another question was for right. Do you think you see the gap with Right. So, but 
I should probably talk to you about it, and maybe you'll give me an idea. But you know, I, I also don't want to overinterpret the data because it is films. You know, I, the fact that we have these films and the fact that we see things that are condo-like and maybe even service like we're already pretty excited about that. The, the fact that you know, it was in the films and. The Just a quick, sort of comments. Last question about the, the whole low fluence or low field, high field, uh, high field fluence thing, right? Right. So, you know, of course. You mentioned that you know you say well in IR you're not you don't you don't think there are, you don't see a lot of low fluence or low feel I forget what you said pumping well but I you know, but, you know, but but I, I would disagree really and it's because you know they may both say up a one megavolt per centimeter squared but that's a much higher field at one terahertz than it is at IR right. you know right. just even in terms of power mode. Right, 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 right. So, so if you, and, and that's really what matters. What does it do to the system? Right. Absolutely. So, and the same if you look at, at fluids, right? Where, where they are the number in an absolute sense is a little more reliable, but not that much because right. then you have to ask what degree of freedom is this yeah. In lots of IR cases, you're driving phonons, or if it's molecules or vibrations, which are kind of harmonic. Right. So those really are. And so one way I would say to look at it is. Is the response something that's really low order perturbation theory describable, right? Or is it clearly not in that low order perturbation yeah. limit, right? And yeah. then you can easily see that, that sure there are lots of IR experiments that you would describe as, you know, low fluids, low sort of low order perturbative responses, yeah. right? I guess the ones that I was referring to, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything you said. But in the context of correlating electron materials yeah. and all the stuff that Andre is doing, no, but, not but that, that, that is really in particular. Like, of course, in a couple, you know, in some beautiful cases, you see very high order responses, right. like persistent and so forth. But in many, it, it's fairly low order, and, and and you can see the, the way this evolves in some of these cases. So no, I mean, I think that's a, exactly what I'm thinking. Uh, you you consider that to be uh, not so. It, it varies. It, it's it, and and in some cases, what I would really say is for the exact same fluids right. under different conditions or a different system or a different temperatures, what you'll really see is a weakly anharmonic phonon response, which is low order perturbative. And and in other cases, because of some um, more dramatic response, will be something that you wouldn't be able to describe. That and and that's why it, 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 to me, it, it's useful to look at the kind of responses. That because the same field may look like a pretty low fluids or a pretty high fluids, depending on yeah. even, but, even kind of subtle. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, you have to take it on a, on a, on a material wide material basis. Yeah. But for like a lot of the F electrons and a lot of these things where you're at low temperatures, there's a, there's a, there's a well defined threshold there in terms of one state within that state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, let's uh, move on to the next speaker. Let's take a